Hello and welcome back to the smoke room. We'll be continuing where we left off in Nick's route, which is right after Yao presents you the map, and he asks you to remember the whole thing. And obviously that's going to be pretty hard for the cougar, because he's kind of dummy thick. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's continue and see what happens. Nick tells me that I don't have to get it all the first time, but I can feel the tiger's gaze on me as I flip through the pages, trying my best not to smudge any of the hard black lines. It's a whole lot easier for me to remember something when it interests me. But when nothing's open to interpretation, and when there's just wrong and right details, that's when I start to feel the rocks tumble around in my head. I flip through these pages until I'm dizzy and I tell them both that I've had enough. I look up into their faces, expecting to see judgement or disappointment but all I can discern from either of their faces is urgency. Urgency and fear. Nick puts out the light and the three of us sit there for a while, like we were all tired from trying to lift something heavy. Bunks creak as some of the other men in the shack toss and turn. But we don't hear anything wet tonight, thankfully. Sleep well, men. Yav was the first to stand, taking his map as he padded back to the lockers. Tomorrow will be long. Every day is long, friend. I stand up too, thinking I should add something, but Nick made himself comfortable, resting supine with his arms behind his back. Is there something you wanted to tell me? I rubbed the back of my neck, feeling the pressure there, and let out a breath of air. Mm, no, not really. Scared I'll fuck up is all. He shrugs. Knowing you, you probably will. Thanks. No plan is perfect. We just have to respond well when things get hard. We have to be smooth. I think back to both of our prior experiences with Will and frown. I don't think either of us is smooth, Nick. Come, come. God frowns on liars. I am as smooth as peanut butter, Samuel. No, you're more like the chunky kind. Yah returns with a very confused look on his face. What? It was nothing. He opens one eye and looks in my direction. Go to sleep, Samuel. Well, if we're gonna fuss about it. If this is fussing, then I will. We won't be here to wake you if you sleep in. Oh, right. As I climb into my bunk, I remember now how we're not supposed to walk together in the morning. I sit in my bed for a while, doing my best to make myself comfortable, buffing the hard, flat pillow behind my head. And then I think of something else to ask again. You got a cock on a farm nearby to crow to wake us up, or will there be a pistol shot? But I can already hear his heavy snores from down below. So I shut my eyes and try to sleep through it. But it's not long before I wake up again. A whole damn chorus of snores meets my ears. Die. I blink from the sudden loud vocalization that's still ringing in my ears, and then I sit up and look around. The cabin is completely dark and everybody seems like they're either under their covers or their shades. Whoever it was, it sounded like a clear, deep and crisp voice, like nobody I've ever heard before. Was somebody talking in their dreams? Or was it just something I dreamt myself? I can't really determine a source of the sound, so I try to close my eyes again. You all deserve to fucking die! My eyelids fling open. That one was a yell so loud it shook the entire cabin. Somebody had to wake up from that. But the snoring continues. I feel my heart beating in my neck and stare at the ceiling. Whoever it was sounded so angry. I feel like I should be able to recognize a voice like that. But there was nobody in my life who came to mind. So, am I dreaming? Some of my clients told me that dreams can happen when you're awake. Maybe this was what was happening to me. I turn my head in the direction of where I thought the noise was coming from because I still can't see shit. No movement down on the floor either. Nor out the window. Well, whatever. I really need to be asleep right now. 
so I shut my eyes again, expecting another shout at ass o'clock in the morning. But it never comes. So I relax again and feel myself drift off finally. Wow. This is really worse than I thought it would be. Some idiot is playing Revel on the trumpet. Last night wasn't the worst night of sleep that I had, but I can feel my body had only just found a way to be cozy, and it was cut short. And for what? For nothing. By a brassy bugle that sounded more like it was being drowned between a man's ass cheeks than its mouth. But maybe somebody else besides me got fed up and shoved it there. I keep my eyes shut, wanting to catch more sleep, but sheeps are rustling all around me and the voices around me are getting rowdy. I think I fade in and out of sleep for a while before I feel something big and heavy on my arm, shaking me. I look to see a massive pair of big, brown eyes staring at me, making me flinch. You have about five minutes before you need to get ready. Mmm, ready. He shook his head. Yao and I are leaving now. The oats and the brown tin in the cupboard by the sink are mine. Make sure you eat. I push his arm off of me and he's gone. The pressure behind my ears is building up again and my head is throbbing. But eventually I manage to roll out of bed. I take Nick's advice and make myself some oats with water from the hot kettle left on the stove, but I feel guilty eating his food. I'll buy some for him later. A funny feeling comes over me when I walk this road alone with strangers. Old memories fill my head. Before, I had Nick to make sure I didn't push myself too hard in the dry heat, or Will to shake his head and smile at me when I did something foolish. I remember nearly crippling myself by letting a minecart slide backwards during a coal haul like it was today. I remember what one of my co-workers said, God must have want me dead to put me with a man as slow as you. Well, maybe he was right. I never saw him again after that. But I didn't need to hear that to know I didn't belong here. Yet here I was, at the mouth of the mine, feeling the wind against me as I followed the half a dozen men into the dark. They told me I should stand in the elevator room. It was easy enough to find, I couldn't forget that room if I tried. A few other men are standing around, expectant. I don't recognize any of them. Top of the morning, men! The voice I heard wasn't one I expected. It was sunny and boyish, but you could almost call it manic too. A very excitable looking golden retriever approaches us. Welcome to the CSCG family. My name's Ben. You think of me as your guide today for all of your newcomers. He flashes us a smile and tips his cap. Brief though it may be. Now that I've heard him speak, I recognize him as the dog from the stag who got into an argument with the bear. He looks a lot different when he isn't snarling. Most of y'all dedicated to the first floor, so if that was mentioned in the brief, I'll ask you to check in with the foreman on this level. He jerks his head to the building behind us, and all of the men but me waddle in that direction. You Sam Ayers fella? He looks and sounds a bit too familiar to be calling me fella. Reckon so. He clasps me on the shoulder and squeezes. Then it looks like you'll be with me, you son of a bitch. Way too over familiar. Just me? Out of the new batch, yeah. But don't worry about that. There's always more. He hops onto the elevator and it swings beneath his feet. Well, come on! The both of us at the same time? Damn straight. She's rocky, but she's sturdy. I try not to look into the wide chasm below as I close the gap between the platform we're standing on and the free swinging elevator. Where's your stuff? Uh, stuff? He cocks his head and lets out a sharp whine. Your tools? Or your lunch? Didn't bring none. The dog lets out a loud whistle that echoes below us far longer than I might have liked it to. Hope you had your hooch and hotcakes this morning because this bitch goes deep. Then flips a switch and the chain sounds of the elevator ring out as we descend. 
You got a 30 minute lunch break at noon, but it takes too damn long to make your way in and out of this level. So you better learn to be prepared from this day forward, for I promise you'll be sorry. You have nobody to blame but yourself if you go hungry. He looks at me as if he expects me to respond to that, but it's true, so I have nothing to add. Where are you from? I've been a local for a while now. And before that? East Coast? You not much of a talker or something? I didn't think there was anything wrong with my answers. Mm, not really, no. That's a shame, then. You gotta have friends in this kind of work. Probably true. Awful hard to make friends if you don't talk so much or talk so well. Right. Well, at least you're speaking my language. The dog clicks his tongue and gives me a wink. More than I can say for most around here. I think you'll do just fine. Thanks. But I don't remember asking. We keep going lower until I feel my ears pop. Then the elevator comes to a stop. What level is this? Third. That didn't seem right. But why is it so deep? Well, why shouldn't it be? Ain't most tunnels just stacked right on top of each other? Says who? Says nobody. Just thought that's how they were supposed to be. Well, ain't everything's gonna be how you expect it. He smiles at me. I wouldn't be worried about it. But I think you should be worried about the foreman's first impression of you. I dropped the back talk. I don't mean no rudeness. I try not to breathe deep, but the air feels thin down here. Just curious is all. Try not to be too curious. There's all sorts of funny smells and sounds here that can get you hurt or worse if you don't know what you're doing. He taps me on the arm and flicks his head in a way that's a little more familiar than I'd like. Let's introduce you to the boss. I notice that the tunnels on the third level, if this really is the third level anyway, have much shorter ceilings than the top floor. It's lucky that my head barely doesn't touch the top of the ceiling. But for Nick, it must be a problem. We can barely see the first man that we come across as he hauls a creaky cart by us, and the squeeze against the wall is tight to let him through. He stops when he comes to a cage behind us. My fur prickles when I hear it rattle and squeal from the top of the vertical shaft, scraping as it descends rapidly. I can hear a soft hum drone in the distance. After we make a few turns, we emerge from the cramped tunnels into a bigger chasm with high ceilings that may be some 60, some 80 feet tall. The noise here is a lot. A large spinning wheel, at least three times my height, creaks when it moves. I can see that it connects to a system of moving belts, and that those connect to a compressor that's humming and vibrating. That in turn connects to a bunch of pipes and hoses that can be followed parallel to a set of tracks. And they lead to more sounds of drilling, hammering, picking and scraping. The tubing is attached to a large mechanical drill sitting on a platform connected to the tracks. It's hard to tell who's manning it in the dim light. But when I get a closer look, it's a sturdy looking Gila monster. When he notices us, he takes a look for a second then redirects his attention to the rocks. It seems like he's either really concentrated on his particular job, or he's ignoring us. I stand in place so long waiting for my guy to say something that I have to shift my weight. Good morning! We're reporting in for today's work, Mr. Moore. He flips off the switch of the machine and takes a look at us. Beckett's fine. His voice sounds surly and gruff. This isn't the military, Keys. What do you need? Briggs asked me to bring our new man to you. Despite how dark as it is, I can tell that the lizard is looking at me slowly from top to bottom. He's not prepared for work. No bag, no hammer, no pick, no nothing. I doubt he even has matches. I know that I'm not even planning to stay here, but this man is doing a good job at making me feel embarrassed. What the hell is this, Keys? Everybody knows they're supposed to supply their own materials. The lizard's tone is getting more and more curt with me. 
I apologize for the inconvenience, sir, but Mr. Hendricks told me that he'd supply those things for me. Let's suppose for a second that's true. When? I'm a little surprised by that question. Though, in all fairness, I probably shouldn't be. It's a pretty fair question. Well, uh... He never actually told me when I'd be getting those things. In all frankness, I'd hope I'd run into him here. You some kind of joker? This is the level 3. Hendrix never comes down here. He's not somebody who likes to get his pressed suit dirty if you catch my drift. Then I suppose that's a bit of a problem for me. That's putting it lightly. If you can't work, we can't get things done. And if you can't work, you don't get paid. Nothing personal. This is the job. Level 3 might not be the best place for a novice anyhow. I take rookies and experts alike if they can work keys. We're undermanned. Maybe he didn't know any better, but if you saw him without equipment, then he shouldn't be down here. You usually know better than that. Wait, don't blame me for the new fellow's mistakes. It's his fault, not mine. Beckett grunted. If I had to blame anybody, it's probably Hendrix, but all of these setbacks have put us weeks behind schedule, and Briggs is pissed. We haven't made much progress on expanding the main shaft, or digging deeper, and the exposed veins will be picked dry before long. I feel the same way if I were in his shoes. Let's just do our best to put things right. Understood? Of course, sir. Understood. The gilla turns away from us and flips the switch to his machine. I brace myself for the loud, chiseling sound again, but all I hear is a click of the switch back and forth. The gilla curses under his breath. Something's wrong with the damn pick again. He circles the machine. The compressor hose is secure, and there's nothing out of line with the hardware. Must be a problem with the compressor itself. Did Kai say he was having any problems with it today? Well, uh... Kai wasn't there? He was supposed to be. That's his assignment today. Then he missed it. So who the hell was there, Keys? I didn't see anybody. You're supposed to report that, damn it! If there's something wrong with the compressor, then it could be the power, and that could affect the vents. I just wasn't thinking about that right now. Jesus Christ, this is dangerous! I'm not to blame for any of this! I don't give a shit about who's to blame, I just need you with me, Keys. Breakdowns like this can cause a lot of problems if we're not on top of them. Where the hell is your head today? Is there a problem? And just like that, my whole body feels a whole lot lighter when I hear Nick's voice. Perfect fucking time. Could be. I need to check on some things. I heard you that this one lacks equipment. He nods to me. I have tools to spare. That could be helpful, Mr. Crawl. Show this man the ropes. He's in extraction duty with you for today. Unless Mr. Keys has some need of him. I don't. Then that's one problem solved. Help me investigate the compressor and wherever Mr. Kai might have went. Of course. The two of them are gone without so much as giving me a second look. Well, that went as poorly as first impressions could go. I saw it all. I want to tell Nick that it feels like this foreman knows I shouldn't be here. But Nick gives me a look that says that there are people everywhere listening. It is unfortunate that the pneumatic rock pick isn't working right now. It's a beautiful piece of technology. But if there are problems with it, the foreman will just have to use his pick and hammer for a while, like the rest of us. So, what do the rest of us do exactly? Nick grunts. In some ways, you are lucky that progress has been slow. Extracting ore is not difficult. You will have no problem while you are with me for today. But it is hard work, so you are going to sweat. I can handle that. 
For a moment, I consider mentioning how that's never bothered him before, but I don't think he would much appreciate it if I said something like that here. But I can't stand the idea of getting grimy for hours on end without grooming myself throughout the day. It's only a week, though. I think I could put up with anything for only a week. The farther we go from Beckett's sight, the harder it is to see the heavy machinery and the torches. The light in Nick's lamp is the only guide we have at the moment. How do any of you manage to see down here? The badger taps his cap. I do just fine with this. But before I could afford the lamp, candles mostly. That's a bit strange to me. Strange? How? I've never seen you without your hat before when you work. I just assume you always had it. Carbide lamps are expensive, my friend. And so is the gas. Still, it's hard for me to picture you without it on for very long. That I can agree with. It gives me comfort. Careful. He lays his big arm across my chest. His headlight shines on a pile of rocks scattered messily on the dirt floor and on the end of the mine track where a wide cart sits. I can hear grunts, then shuffling of bodies and rocks scattering all around me, but I can barely see anything in front of me. Let's find a spot that isn't so crowded. I want to tell him that I don't mind because I can't even see anybody, but I don't think I should second guess him. Here's a nice spot. Come. There's a big outcropping of rock besides a wooden scaffold. It looks like a grey formless mass until Nick shines his light on the piece which has streaks that sparkle like the stars in the sky. If you have not seen one before, this is what the silver vein looks like. Vein's kind of a strange choice of a name, isn't it? Strange how? It's just the word is all. Makes me think about blood, not metal stuck in rocks. And blood pumps. It's always moving. If you find it in something, it means it's alive. It is interesting to me how often when we talk, you make me think about your language. Did I say something dumb again? I hope that's not a bad thing. Not at all. But vein is a very good word for this occurrence as a concept. Blood does flow through veins. Water flows through the cracks in the earth, carrying mineral sediments with it. Over time, those minerals crystallize, filling the cracks, leaving compounds between the ores. As we dig deeper, we are only following where the water once was. If you do not want to call these deposits veins, you could simply say that we are following the seepage. I don't like that at all, actually. In fact, I hate that. He stares at me. Seepage, Samuel. What are you both talking about? I flinch because I hear Yao's voice before I see him. He's so quiet when he walks. Just in time. I was going to show Sam the ore extraction process. Let me help you then. Those can get dangerous. He could just jump into it. I don't mind a demonstration before trying. Sure. The tools you should have on hand are a pickaxe, a sledgehammer, a spike, matches, and a stick of dynamite. Picks are for the softer rocks and packed gravel. The rest is for dislodging and breaking apart big deposits. I can barely see Yao crouch down and wrestle with the bag. He comes back into Nick's light, holding a long, thick steel spike in his paw. I hold this while Nick embeds it into the rock with one good, strong swing. If I don't keep still, he could miss and crush my fingers. Excuse me? Nick hefts the sledgehammer behind his back, squeezing the handle. Shifts his weight into the swing, pausing in the air just a bit. Now! And then he brings it down. I look away and hear a horrible crunching noise. I think about the sable's hand, wondering if this is the way he lost it. You can stop looking away now. The spike is in. I open my eyes. The large spike looks like it's several inches deep into the wall. Why would you let him do that? Because he never misses. You can thank my hat. 
The light beam helps me focus, and the weight of it is just right. I'm not thanking your hat. It was just an expression, Samuel. You say that, but I know that you really love that hat. Still, you made it look so easy, but that can't be safe. You think this is our first time doing this? The head of the spike is wide enough that the hammer should never come into contact with your fingers if you grab the center. Once the spike is in, all we have to do is place the dynamite in the cracks, come back and let the walls crumble. So nobody ever gets hurt doing this? We didn't say that, but the two of us have worked together long enough to coordinate our actions. There are ways to tap into it too, but it takes much longer. With more swings, you add more chances to make mistakes. Nick had told me stories about driving steel into rock before, and it always sounded exhausting. But I didn't understand how risky it was. If it hurts his or Yao's paw, they might be out of a job. Nick does this nearly every day from dawn until dusk, for less than even what I make. I want you to hold the spike now, Sam. What? I know what I heard, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. Why? Nick's expression turns stern. So you know what to do when somebody tells you to do this, when we aren't here. I don't want to hold it. I understand. He leans in close to me and whispers. I do not want you to do it either, but I cannot always be here. It will look suspicious if we're always together. They will eventually force us apart. That's why I want to prepare you for anything. Nick pulls the spike out from the rock and places it in my paw. The spike feels warmer than I thought it would be, and Nick's paw lingers there, squeezing mine shut. Then he guides it to the surface of the rock. Remember. Grip the center and hold it still. I nod, squeezing the spike harder than I mean to. On three, he takes a step back. One, he hefts the hammer onto his shoulder. Two, he lifts it. I stare up at it, up at him. The blunt head of the hammer rises above me. It suddenly occurs to me that if Nick wanted revenge for what I did to his former co-worker, this would be the easiest way to do it. After all, those sorts of accidents happen all the time. No matter how hard I try, it's impossible to block out this place's dark, damp, earthy smell. And Jack's smell. The sharp tang from the iron in his blood, and the acrid smell of the shit from his guts filling his pants. Three! I feel the rush of wind, then hear the crunch. The spike is embedded in the rock again, and I can let go. I feel a slight ting in my hands from the force of the blow. But that's all, really. My heart is thumping in my throat. Good, you let go. You never want to hold on to the spike once it is lodged this far in. He hammered the spike up its head into the rock, then pulled the spike out. And now for the fun part. He cupped his mouth with his hands and bellowed up behind him. Blast! We hear the shuffling of feet and the rumble of voices some distance away from us, moving farther away still. When I say go, we go. He crouches and wrestles with the pack on his floor, then puts the bag on his back, retrieving the thin black capsule with the fuse clasped in his left hand. Then he holds the fuse to his lamplight. Wait for the hiss. The fizzy sound of the sparks are unmistakable. Now you place the dynamite into the hollow spike hole, and you run. He seems surprised to see that Yao and I are already a considerable distance away from him, so he breaks into a run to catch up. Yao pulls me by the sleeve around a barrier of rocks and scaffolding and tells me to duck and cover my ears. The blast is louder than any gunshot I've ever heard. I can feel the weight from the explosion briefly in my knees, connecting to the ground. We can hear the rocks tumble over another, and it continues for several minutes as the shattered vein crumbles and collapses, spilling out its sparkling clusters. 
So what now? Now we pick up the small pieces and put them in the cart. And we crush the larger pieces with the hammer until they are fit for transport. It feels like we spent hours crushing and hauling rocks, loading them onto the minecart, pushing the cart to a cage for transportation, then unloading the rocks. About halfway through the pile, the foreman comes and drags the owl off somewhere for something else. So the rest of the work goes even slower. I feel pretty uncomfortable by the time we clear the pile. My fur is slick with sweat, but there's a thin film of dust and debris on top of that. There's a stiffness in each clump of fur when I move. I desperately need to wash up. Nick, I'm starting to think that holding the spike wasn't so bad. Oh? This work is nasty. I haven't been this dirty for only a few hours since I worked in my cousin's slaughterhouse. Is that so? You should expect for there to be a lot of dirt when you work beneath the ground. I don't mind it when it's all around me. It's a different story when it's all up on me and sliding against me in places it probably shouldn't be. Well, we can clean you up when the lunch whistle blows. But still, I will not bother. You will get dirty again in the afternoon anyway. Oof. I see most of Nick's upper body lurch forward as he looks ahead, eyes widening with surprise. Then he lurches forward, nearly skipping to keep himself from toppling over. I have to put my hand in front of the mongoose, who's yelling in a language that I don't understand to keep him from pushing Nick again. But then he starts pushing me. Hey, what's his problem? I don't know. I can't understand what he's saying either. But I can probably guess. Your friend takes up most of the tunnel. I look at the walls again. They're definitely exaggerating. You can pass us by. The badger steps up, pushing his back awkwardly against the wall to give the mongoose and the blue jay room to run by. The mongoose does. The blue jay doesn't. Nick sounds a lot more quiet than usual. His face is impossible to read. Barely. I don't know what this asshole's problem is, but he's definitely wasting our time. You gonna walk past or what? We've got things to do. Everybody down here has things to do. It might be hell of a lot easier if your foreign friend ate less. Your mouth moves an awful lot for a party of one. And for somebody skinnier than most depictions of Christ on the crucifix. Blessed be his name. You slow or something? Please do not cause trouble on your first day, Sam. Since when did I cause trouble? The Blue Jay walks past us after all. Hey, what's this? The Blue Jay snatches Nick's hat and looks at it, hopping several steps backwards. This looks like a fire hazard. I think Foreman Moore should have a look at this. Nikolai has the Blue Jay against the wall. He's grabbing him with both arms, gripping tight, squeezing. Then he takes his hat back. You will not touch that. He grips both of the Blue Jay's shoulders and slams him back against the wall. Not now. He slams again. Not later. He slams again. Not ever. He puts his hat back on his head and the Blue Jay stumbles forward. I didn't notice until now, but Nick is actually heaving. The Blue Jay has a dazed sort of look, like he's confused to be where he is right now. Then he shook his head, like he was lost. Is there something going on here? The Golden Retriever is standing behind us, walking up to the scene. Is something the matter, Nate? The Blue Jay just shakes his head and spits on the floor before turning to leave. He looks from Nick, then to me, and his expression sours. Oh, you again. What about me again? Now, I don't know what's going on, but I don't think we're off to a great start. Come again? Do you remember what your boss said? Uh... We do work, we get paid. If everybody can't figure out how to get along, we won't get anything done. 
And now I see two of our good workers at each other's throats this early in the week? Are you an instigator, Mr. Ayers? Are you a foreman, Keys? I've heard this voice before. From the prior night. It was the bear from the stag. The one Nick and Yao knew. Move along, Dimitri. This doesn't concern you. And management certainly doesn't concern you. You're still not a boss. Wait. He isn't? For some reason I assumed that he was another foreman. And that's really weird. I don't have to be a manager to, to care about the state of the man's morale. But in a very real capacity, you are not qualified to be. Am I wrong, Keys? I have seniority over this man. And I have seniority and experience over you. Doesn't really mean a thing now, does it? Well, maybe it should. Though I have to say, there's a difference in having seniority as a grunt for two years versus having it for ten. I'm happy where I am. We'll have to chat about how happy you are with your life in eight years. I have a hunch we won't be in contact by then. You're still young. I wouldn't trust too many of your hunches. Like for instance, that fist you threw last night with your thumb positioned behind your knuckles. Ben smacks the side of the mining cart. Not here. Not today. Let's have a clean day today. I want some order on the third floor. Then control yourself and lead by example. After all, it's all that I can do. Ben shuffs as he walks away in a moody swagger. You fellas all right? Of course. Well, I am anyway. But Nick... I can't really say. He's staring at the ground and his arms are folded. I hadn't really ever seen him that intense before. At least, not in that way. I've seen him emotional in private before. And he's told me he's been in fights before. But I've never seen him grab a guy. Although I guess he's grabbed me before plenty. But it wasn't like that. Something about that scared me. I hope he's alright. I guess I should be careful about touching his hat myself. I need a moment to gather my thoughts. A ghostly iron whistle blows through the tunnels. Just take care to bring them into the mess area. You don't want to skip out on the best part of the day. You'd think that would be going home. That's at night. Oh. That's true. I guess. The bear is holding his chest as he rolls out in bursts of laughter at his own joke. It's the kind of laugh that reminds you of embers crackling in the autumn campfire. I think you get what's important. But it doesn't sit right when somebody tells me you shouldn't find a way to be comfortable with a day of honest work. Trust me, when you get to a certain age, it's good to have something or other that keeps you busy. I never have much trouble staying busy. Neither did I. Until later. He sends us a casual salute and wanders off down the tunnel. I have held us up for long enough. We should go. I wouldn't be too concerned about me. I didn't pack away anything to eat. Why would that make me less concerned? You must eat some. I've skipped lunch plenty of times before. More recently than before, to be honest. Some cornbread, collards, and pork would be nice right about now. We will ask some of the men to share. Or barter if we must. The mess hall, which is more of a dimly lit cavern with stools scattered about it than a hall, has a row of iron lockers against the beam and earth walls. Nick walks up to a locker and twists the knob on a combination lock. He stores his tools inside while withdrawing a tin pail with a handle. There is a very small, very yellow duck discreetly painted on one of the sides. I don't think I realized this before. Realize what? I shrug. You know. How much you like ducks. There is nothing foul about a bathing waterfowl. I stop walking. Excuse me? 
That was the first sentence that I learned in this country's language. Oh. I think that makes more sense. More sense than what? The sentence being sentimental more than... I guess, really liking ducks. What do you mean? I do like ducks, Samuel. He sounds completely serious right now. Everybody likes ducks. He says that like it's a fact rather than an opinion. I'm not sure whether I should laugh with the expectation that he'll join in too. Or nod without cracking a smile. I go with a nod. I breathe in through my mouth and pretend to sneeze to mask that I'm trying not to laugh. Bless you. The angst. I'm lucky that it's dark. Good noon to both of you. Even in the dim light, it's hard to miss Yao's brilliant fur pattern. He sits on a bench, slicing a piece of cured meat onto thick, brown bread that's placed on top of his lunch pail. I tilt my head looking for another small painting of a duck. Then I feel stupid when I don't find one. Are you... alright? He's hungry. I don't think he knew that he had to pack his own lunch. I frown. I don't like this notion Nick had that it's a regular habit of mine to leer at everyone else's lunch like I'm a lunatic when I forget to prepare a meal. But it sounds less crazy than the truth. That I was looking for a duck. Here. The tiger holds up a slice of bread and meat to me. Thanks, but don't feel pressure to offer me anything. I always pack more than I need. Why? Because this isn't the first time somebody has forgotten their lunch. Or had their stolen. When you're hungry and hundreds of feet beneath the ground, you might agree to more than you normally would when you're out of options. That's why we have to be ready to feed those who need it. Or barter with those who don't. I ate the bread and the meat Yao handed me, which was very good, but very salty. Nick offers two hefty slices of kielbasa. I tried to refuse, but he does not let me. We eat, fill one another in about the day's events that we miss. Yao told us about how he had to replace one of the bands running the compressor so that he could get the rock drill running again. Nick mentions the fight. Except, he doesn't mention what happened with his hat. I don't know why this bothers him as much as it does, but it might not be my business to know. I sit there and wonder what would happen if I brought it up. Sam Ayers? The rumbling of all the men's voices around me dampens under the foreman's booming voice and I see a few heads turn in the source of the direction. I flinch when I hear the foreman say my name, then scramble to my feet. Uh, yes sir? I can't see much but I can see a pair of glowing reptilian eyes staring at me from behind the clearing crowd of cramped bodies. Come speak with me. Nick whispers to me. It'll be fine, Sam. I want to believe that he's beaming a big, warm smile at me as he says this, but the truth is I can't even see his face clear enough anymore in the low light. The noise from the men starts up again as I move through the crowd. I can see the silhouette of the lizard jerking his head as he wanders into a tunnel. It's pretty apparent from the motion of his tail that I'm supposed to follow. He takes me to a cage where there's a rather large crate sitting adjacent to the entrance. It's already been opened by a crowbar. What's this? Easy enough. He starts pulling items out of the crate. Brand new pickaxe. And a hammer. Several spikes. A case full of dynamite, some rope, and a card. Card, sir? He unfolds a very nice piece of cardboard, then clears his throat. <clears throat> From one explorer to another. I hope you'll find what you're looking for, Samuel Ayers. Signed, James Hendricks III. So, it did come today. Beckett Moore is nodding at me. So it did. This, uh, magnanimity, shall we call it, doesn't tend to happen around here. He lowered his voice. If any of my boys saw that you got a complete set of sparkling new tools, you'd have made a bitter enemy out of every one of them. 
Now, I don't know if Hendrix loves you or hates you, because this is a mixed message if I ever saw one. You honestly don't look like you're cut from the same cloth as most of the men down here. Save me the trouble and tell me your relationship to Hendrix. If you're one of his dandy friends, and this is some sort of bet to impress one another, I promise I don't care a whit, and I'll let you tend to your pride. But this is a dangerous area, and it's about to get a lot more dangerous. I don't know what to say. I feel that I'm about to sputter. Sir, I don't know this Mr. Hendrix well at all, really. He just took a sudden shine to me. He's the reason I have a job here is all. I swear it. Beckett stares me down and nods. If you're lying, it's a wild one. I believe you. Because you're a damn fool, if you're down here for any other reason than you're a hard worker, and you know how to exercise a considerable amount of care in an active shaft expansion. Let's get you set up with the locker. I'll store the extra tools so it won't look like you got them all at once. Then I will pull you into action and see what you can do. It's all disagreeable to you? Yes, sir. That's what I like to hear. I'll carry half of your equipment. Follow me for a while. He walks me back to a small lean-to, disappears to it, and then reappears with a small slip of paper. This is your locker combination. If you can't remember it, don't lose it. Left 8, right 16, left 3. You can store what you aren't using for now, but you're going to need most of it. He guides me back to the mess hall and rings a big metal triangle. Alright, listen up, man. Team Red, I want you to keep extracting veins. Team Blue, I want you to work on the floor today. The smelters need extra hands. Team Yellow, and that's most of you, you just follow me east. He taps me on the arm with the back of his wrist. That's you. I nod and hoist my things as a large crowd of men walks towards and past me. I look around for Yao and Nick, waiting to see if they're coming, but they're lost in a large crowd. You coming, Ayers? Ah. I still can't see them. Uh, yeah. We walk for about 10 minutes until we come to the mouth of the tunnel that empties into an abrupt end. I bump into something hard and cold, and hear frantic flapping. It sounds like... a little bird? With the rock chisel back in action, we're going to make a long expansion of the eastward tunnel. We still in drilling any vertical expansions? There was an edge in the tone of his voice. As much as I don't like to second guess you, Beckett, Ben might have a point here. There's been an unusual amount of hazardous gases and water leaks at this depth. It's not the worst idea to try a different depth, I don't think. The assayer told us that there's an unusually small amount recovered here from the expected concentrations in the water, so we're going to keep digging. We got unlucky with the aquaclude once, but with the water table being so low in these parts, we don't have to fear more flooding. Unless there's more aquacludes at this depth? Or some stupid fuck drills diagonal and up straight into Emma, but I think we'd notice that. A lot of the men laugh. A few of them just look confused and whisper in more languages that I don't understand. At least I'm not the only one who feels a little lost. Nate can help with the detonations. And me, sir? The lizard pulled up his hat and scratched under his head. Make sure the drill cord isn't damaged and assist Nate with the explosives. The dog shifts his weight on his feet a little, as if expecting something else, but then he nods quickly. Sir, yes sir. Dimitri, you gather up the rest of the men to extend the rails. Easily done. We're all told to wait outside of the tunnel while another blast goes off. We duck and cover for three more explosions, falling the shattered bedrock out in small pieces. I notice the rabbit from the last night speaks up. His Sonoran accent is a little thick, but that might be exacerbated due to the muffling from his handkerchief. I'll go fetch wood. Of course you're fetching wood. The stout wolverine is here too. Because you know it would take me longer to fetch the spikes. 
You're the best at it. The best? You always know just what to say. The two of them went off. Are those two alright? Those two? Better than. That's their dynamic. They like to give each other shit. I couldn't tell if it was tense or not. You won't have the delusion for long. You know when Paul is angry. Like last night? So you still remember us. That's good. Hard to forget what happened. Ben will have the hardest time forgetting, I imagine. They tossed him out the stag for at least a week. He's bruised beneath the fur. But at least, the poor boy's not limping. It's usually not so pretty after somebody tries to take on Paul. Though, looking at your muscles, you might stand a chance. I'd rather not get on anybody's bad side. And you won't, so long as you don't do anything dumb or dangerous. That doesn't come for me much. Or egg us into overtime without demanding extra pay from the bosses. The bear lets out a dark chuckle. I don't think we're gonna see Ben try and pull that off again anytime soon. The bear hands me an extra shovel. We're gonna dig a straight through, about four inches deep, so nothing too complicated. Simple's fine for me. So let's chat to pass the time while we work. What's your story? I dig my shovel deep into the ground. Ain't got much of one. Everybody has a story. Who says you get to read mine? You first then. Well, unlike our friend Ben, I was actually a soldier. For a... Uh, Ruthenia, right? No, no, not for the Rust people. For this country, I emigrated when I was very young. So, how come you aren't there now? After getting more than my fill of violence, I decided that I wanted to build more than I wanted to fight. And their engineer CEOs believed I was better on the battlefield than with the wrench. Of course, I did not take their advice to heart. So when my time was up, I finished for good, and I have been here ever since. Must have been a long, boring change of pace comparatively. You'd come to appreciate boring after seeing the things I've seen. He starts to whistle. Though, there are far more boring places to be than the bottom of a mine. This one boring you with his war stories? The Jackrabbit and the Wolverine were back, each carrying a sack respectively. No. Good, because he's a beast. A downright demon. Don't let his doleful eyes lure you into a false sense of security. If you're gonna talk about my eyes, you could use any other word than doleful. The Wolverine sets a big sack of metal tracks on the floor. Mark my words, you watch yourself if you cross this old soldier. He knows death better than any of us. You end up between his paws, and he'll shred your hide like it was warm butter. Please do not mind, Paul. He likes to lie on purpose. As opposed to lying on accident. And there's a lie itself. The jackrabbit rolled his eyes. Alright, it's time to get back to work, boys. We can pack the earth down and place planks two boards apart. You can measure gaps with a ruler if you want, but this saves a lot of time, and it's just as effective. Dimitri shows us how to put the rails together. Each iron piece is already designed to lock, and spikes driven through the holes in the metal to bolt them down to the earth. By the time we have 20 feet of railing, I'm surprised that several hours have already rolled by. I'm surprised by how long this takes. He chuckles. It will take longer if it's wrong, and we have to redo it. I crouch down, hinging my knees and wiping the sweat from my brow. As dark and dirty and dangerous as everything has been today, the experience has been, well, relatively normal. As far as I can tell, Nick and Yao keep one another safe. Maybe you're fine as long as you're not alone. Then again, it's nowhere near the witching hour, even if it is underground. Foreman wants to see you, Ayers. Of course, this guy comes to me on the first break I'm taking. For what? Can't say, but you should come along now. 
Alright. I give my new co-workers a half wave by opening my palm. Be right back, hopefully soon. They're a bit focused on their work still to notice. It's strange to think that the tunnel we're walking down now is already about 10 times the length that it was when we started today. Stabilization beams that weren't there earlier are already finished. Beckett is sitting at the end of the tracks, looking grumpy. You're keeping up with your work, Ayers? Laying tracks ain't so bad. Good to hear. Good to hear. Unfortunately for me, the rock pick is shitting itself again. So we have to blow up the bedrock the old-fashioned way. Oh. Oh no. I want to see if you're capable of handling a controlled blast. The lizard took a pick out from his pocket and placed it in an angle at knee's height on the bedrock in front of us. Pick up my sledge, Ayers. I do. It's not that heaviest thing that I've ever held, but it sure feels like it's trying to drag me down to the earth with its weight like nothing I have ever touched before. Sir, are you sure you should be the one holding the pick? I don't see why not. Everybody has to at some point. I've done it before, and I'll do it again. He's a novice, though. He could really mess up your hand. Keys, you've been off all day. Sir? Why do you think I'm asking him to hold a sledge right now, and not you? If he's going to work here, he needs to learn how to do this. I'm sorry, sir. You're right, sir. He looks at me. Put one foot in front of the other and bend your knees, then stare at the tip of the pick. I follow his instructions as best as I can. Very good. Now lift the hammer. It's so fucking heavy. Easy as she goes, Ayers. Easy as she goes. My palms are starting to sweat as I look at his scaly hands. Then I keep my eyes on the tip of the pick, like he says. Now swing! I hesitate. Swing! I bring it down and hear the crunch. Beckett rises from the floor. Perfect hit. Now you just tap it in, gentle-like. I beat into the rock and Beckett nods again. That'll do it. I exhale. This rock's a big one, so we need another hole on the other side. God fucking damn it. I know what's coming next. I want you to hold the spike this time. I feel numb as he explains what Nick had explained to me earlier. I still don't like the idea of this. I don't care how skilled or used to it somebody says that they are. But I tell myself what I did last time. It's only a week. Beckett points out the area he wants to steal Driven, takes the hammer from me, and gives me the spike. I place my hand where I'm supposed to go and wait for Beckett to get into position. Hey, Mr. Moore? Yes? Let me drive the steel this time. What? What's wrong with this guy? I don't think so, Keys. You've been off all day. I promise I'm not. Just let me show you that I can handle this. Besides, with the pick and the compressor acting up like this, I'm going to need to help anyway. Alright, fine. What? No, not fine. Should I say something? What to think I'm being paranoid about this man who, in total fairness, I have put into a lot of inconvenient positions through no fault of my own? But still. I swallow my own spit as I see this dog get into position and heft the sledgehammer. He gives me a nod and has a calm expression. But then I see every muscle in his face furrow and tighten. His brow is tightly wrinkled. His eyeballs bulge with a sudden force of white hot anger that I can feel in my bones. Every instinct I have ever felt told me that it was the presence of evil and that if I stayed still, I would die. As he begins to swing, he takes two steps forward and I can tell that his eyes are not on the head of the spike. They are on my forearm. So I drop the spike and take three steps back as a sledge makes the contact with the bedrock, cracking off a good piece of it. Ben is looking at the hammer's head, almost surprised to see it hadn't made contact with anything. Beckett takes it from him. 
What the hell was that, Stance? That's how I usually drive the steel in. Are you sure? The way Beckett's phrased this didn't make it sound much like it was a question. That was sloppy and that was reckless. It's never caused any problems for me, with all due respect, sir. I don't blame Ayers for dropping the spike. But Ayers... He exhaled. That was dangerous, too. Any impact with a sledge like that can cause a cave-in. Or it could bounce off the rock and bludgeon your organs. I've seen both of those happen. He shakes his head again. My gut was right about your stake, he's... I don't have time to make mistakes like this. There wouldn't have been any mistakes if Nate was holding the spike, sir. I'm not interested in ifs. You're on beam duty. Ayers, you're back on the rails. Right away. I start walking away as fast as I can. Something tells me that this man is looking at the back of my head, but I don't want to look behind me and meet his eyes if he is. I don't know what's wrong with this man, but I do know that I shouldn't be near him while we work. My heart is racing when I get back to Dimitri, Felipe, and Paul. Dimitri seems to notice that something is wrong and asks, but I don't address it knowing that Ben is probably in earshot. I just want to be done with this day and work as quickly and quietly as I can. I don't have much energy or focus left by the time the last work whistle blows. I remember that Nick and Yao don't want us to be seen together when we're coming or leaving from work so I don't bother waiting at the lockers and take my lift with Dimitri. He tells me I should grab a drink at the stag with the rest of the men, but I turn it down. It feels good to be welcomed, but it doesn't feel good to turn those people away when you have prior obligations. He introduces me to the washing stations, which is more or less one massive room with a shower. It's filthy and packed full of naked bodies washing the soot and coal and the grime out of their fur. The water's cold, and the soap is scentless. My nose wrinkles when my fur turns from gray to white, but it still feels good to be clean again. But when I leave the mines, I find joy in the fact that I can find Nick and Yell on the road, walking slowly and discreetly. Congratulations on finishing your first day, Sam. And all without incident, too. I grab both of their sleeves and shake my head. No. That isn't true. I fill them in on everything. James's gift, Dimitri and Beckett taking a shine to me, Ben's reaction, Beckett's appreciation strained. That chain of events concerns me. It's hard to believe that Ben's ambition would push him to try something like that. But he still has not been promoted. Perhaps it was a long time coming. It was a mistake to let them part with us at lunch in the first place. It would have been a bigger mistake to ignore Becca's instructions for where we were supposed to be. If he's already suspicious of Sam's presence due to James's gift, we wouldn't want to implicate ourselves in that. Breaking protocol would make Beckett talk to James, and that's the last thing we want. Fuck protocol! I want to protect my friend. We are not doing a good job. I like you too much to be comfortable with you yelling at me like that, Nick. Nick, it's fine. I handled it myself, okay? No. It is not okay, Sam. You should have stayed at the bunks during the day while Yao and I work. You are dirty. You are uncomfortable. You barely escaped an injury, and people want to harm you now? Only one person does, I think. Maybe Ben was just having a terrible day and let his emotions get the better of him. Or maybe he just genuinely is an idiot and didn't mean any harm at all. I know that I'm crazy. I know that what I see and feel isn't always reliable, even if it feels real in the moment. I thought Nick was going to hurt me too, but I can't tell him that. I honestly don't entirely know what Hendrix wants, but that's something I don't want to think about right now. One thing at a time. One person trying to hurt you is one person too many. It's too late for me to suddenly quit. 
And besides, I still want to be down there. I made that choice myself. But there is no reason for you to be down there. He lowered his voice. Especially now that you know how to extract ore. There is a reason. I want to look out for you. Both of you. Yao knows. The badger turns his head to the tiger. Yao knows what precisely. The tiger inhales, then exhales. There is some sort of aberration in the mines. Nick looks to his friend, then to me with confusion. Then his eyelids narrow. In aberration. He says the word extra slow and lets it hang in the air. We both heard it. I certainly heard something, though I cannot confirm what it was. Like I told your friend, it could be an animal, or it could be vapors affecting our judgment. I do not deny. A possibility. That it could be something else entirely. But I have put forward what I believe to be most likely truths. I am confident that I can protect myself and Samuel from any natural or unnatural element in the mine. But I am not confident that I can protect them from evil people. So this remains my concern. Is there any way that I can address that without quitting? Only if there's a way for us to stay together. I want to be able to see you through the whole day. We would also need to consistently be on the same team color when Beckett splits us up. Couldn't we just ask him? No. Out of the question. Moore takes his job very seriously. He considers knowing his men key to managing their positions. I am certain that he will investigate tonight why James sent you a crate of new tools. And I'd wish you tell me when he finds out. I do not trust Beckett, but I do not think he means us any harm. However, if he manages to connect that the three of us are associated, a lot of powerful men will also find out. Our group needs to be both assured and look coincidental. So, how do we do that without breaking protocol or being discovered? There isn't a way. Actually, there is. What? How? Chang. Oh. That Sable from the tent who has dirt on me because I caught him smoking. I don't think he'll help me. I think he will. There's something that he wants. Listen. Let's return to the cabin. I will prepare a letter for you. If you give it to him and have him read it, I know that he will cooperate. And I will prepare dinner for us all. There will be no voluntary starvation in my midst. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. This is actually an extra long episode, so this should be a good uh, stopping point. So yeah, that was, I guess, meeting the crew the first day. We got to have a proper look at Dimitri, Paul, and Felipe. And, you know, we got to, I guess, hang out a little bit with um, Yao and Nick. And we also got to meet one of Flynn's ancestors one of because there's actually two of them uh beckett more he seems to be a little bit more agreeable than flynn but then again flynn you know has his own issues going on but they both seem to be very hard-working individuals so that you know is probably a family trait with them but yeah i like dimitri the big bear and uh the wolverine and the jackrabbit they look like cool individuals <laughs> It's kind of funny because a little thing that I uh, find that gets pointed out is Felipe has a Sonoran accent, which means he's from the Sonoran Desert area, which is where I'm from. And that would actually be Southern California 
and the Arizona area and some of Baja Mexico and then some of Mexico too. So it's ba basically the desert southwest. But yeah, it's it's funny when they say Sonoran and it's even mentioned in Arches, like this a Sonoran flag. It's like they're referring to this area where I live. So it's like, hey, look, I I'm from there. <laughs> but yeah, uh, anyways. Uh, so what do you guys think is going to happen in the mines? Because this Ben fella, the Golden Retriever, seems to have a grudge with all the miners, or at the very least with the group that Samuel is associating with, even though he was actually going to hurt Sam. So it may just be all the miners. In my head, I'm thinking that the voice that Samuel heard while he was asleep, or trying to sleep, was actually Ben. It could either actually be Ben shouting, and nobody else heard it, or it could actually just be Ben's emotions, because you know this is Echo, and it deals with a lot of, like, inner thoughts and stuff like that, it, but yeah. Anyways, um, I mean, by being Echo, I mean the town, not the, the story. <laughs> this is the smoke room. But yeah, um, anyways, thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play the smoke room yourself, there will be a link down in the description. If you would like to support the Echo Project, there will also be a link down for their Patreon, where you will get early access to all of their current works. And I guess I will also post the the Echo Project Twitter in case you want to follow them. And you can actually find um, both writers, uh, Red the Sheep and um, George Squared, who basically are, you know, writing all of the smoke room. And if you have any questions for the story, you can actually ask them. They have a curious cat, both, I think. Or just George. I think both of them do. So if you have any questions about the story or like little theories, you can ask them and they might be able to answer you. There's a lot of people that do that anyways already, but still. So I guess that's it for now. And I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.